So, good day everyone. We are going to be starting our pediatrics and hopefully we'll be done with that today for the fives, the two fives. And uh, uh, we don't need to really dwell so much on uh, this course because it has some similarities with internal medicine that we've done before. So, we'll pretty much be right going straight to the answers and why they chose the answer and not so much on differential. And so, just cover that. So, and I hope we are preparing very well for the for the exams. So this is the first question. This is a patient that is having low grade fever, arthritis, colic abdominal pain, you see purple rash on skin, uh, gut positive stool, this is kidney pain affected. The question is what's the most likely diagnosis? So we have about four organs being affected, and there's one disease which they told us that we have the joint form. Yeah, we have the abdominal form, we have the cutaneous form, and we have the renal form, and that is uh, enoxulin purpura hemorrhagic vasculitis. That's about four forms, so that is typical for this factor. So the answer here is uh, enoxulin vasculitis. Enoxulin vasculitis. Rocky spotted mountain fever. Probably there's no question that I have this in the answer, so they may not really also bring it. This tick typhus blues disease. And lupus, they will tell us about butterfly rash or air lesions and so on. Okay, a young boy is having painful indurations in the periperial -peri papillary regions of the mammary gland. So we are being advised to leave these indurations untouched. Reading through this question, the, the, this is a patient that is having intermittent wheezing. You can think of bronchial asthma and there is current Currently, there is an attack, and that's the reason for the admission in this patient. So they asking us, which medication can we not use in this patient? Of course, we are thinking of only giving medications that can act instantaneously to receive, to relieve the attack first. So the medication that cannot be applied here is chromoline sodium. Chromoline sodium is a mast cell stabilizer, and it has long-term onset of action and duration. So it's not for reversing acute onset of. Uh, asthma or the asthmatic attack itself. So what's the correlation between hypertension and bronchial asthma? Is renal disease. Renal disease. I don't really know the pathology of that very well, maybe because of the uh, you know, immunological reactions. Reading through this, this is like a hygiene question. Hopefully we touch hygiene and then we mention, I just mentioned the normal values of some of these things. But in this particular case, area of world is 18, Height is 3 years, temperature is 20, relative humidity is 36 years, 45, air velocity is 0.3, so yes, normal is 0.1 to 3, 1.5 is normal, noise level 30 is normal, even 35 is normal. Do hygienic evaluation of this, but the question says a patient with thyrotoxicosis, which means that this patient is probably having hypothermia and so on. So you need a cooler environment. You don't need the normal environment. You need a much cooler environment for this particular patient on admission. So this normal climate for a normal person is actually discomfortable for a patient that is having um, thyrotoxicosis. Okay. What acid is digested with nervous arthritic diathesis? What acid can affect your joints? That's uh, uric acid. This is a patient that is having uh, complaints of fever. You can see polyacuria, frequent painful uh, urination. There is proteinuria, leukocyturia, and bacteria. So they are not telling us about immateria. That is helping us to rule out easily acute glomerulonephritis. And, uh, but you know that this bacteria, leukocyturia, and uh, this frequent painful urination is also typical, very typical for acute pyelonephritis. So this is a case of acute pyelonephritis. In acute cystitis, to differentiate it with that, there will be burning sensation of urination, so there will be dysuria in, uh, in cystitis, there will be dysuria in cystitis, above the superpubic region. A patient is having, a patient suffered from tonsillitis, I know that patients that suffer from tonsillitis, from strep, after some time, they could develop other systemic form of illness, if not properly treated. And we are, we'll be talking about maybe like rheumatic fever, for example, and such uh, immunological diseases, we need to treat them with uh, prednisolone or steroids. So the correct answer in this case is prednisolone. 
when you discover that a patient is on operative patient having dullness on percussion, we spoke about this in internal medicine. This a lot of consolidation, probably pneumonia. But when they tell you that there's pills, there's flushing on one side of the shake. Flushing on one side of the shake is typical for cruppers pneumonia or lobar pneumonia. So in the exam, even if other options are very close, yeah, of course this is not very close at all. It's still uh, cruppers pneumonia. Notice that they said this patient had upper respiratory infection and they use the word viral. Viral. Vira. Acute given nephritis is more of uh, uh, bacteria, strep, group, uh, strep, streptococcus. So, but here they said the patient is having acute respiratory viral infection, complaints of pain in lumbar region, nausea, dysuria, and they're having immateria. So, this case is presenting like uh, global nephritis, but it's not. We have this dysuria more in other lower part, lower part of the. Uh, renal system, not the glomerulus. So special gravity, you see, special gravity is 1002, a little bit low. The blood creatinine level is elevated, potassium level, yeah, potassium level is 6.4, which means that it's, 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 it's elevated, patient is losing uh, potassium. So, so something is having, happening at the level of the, at the level of the tubules. And uh, one thing is, is Acute interstitial nephritis, many times patients have history of upper respiratory viral infection. So this is a case of acute interstitial nephritis. When they tell you about viral infection and they give you other parameters, especially they will also tell us about potassium, which will be right. Okay, this question, the most important thing is also important to attention to know when the answer is versus incompatibility and when the answer is ABO incompatibility. A neonate was born from the first gestation on time. There was jaundice and indirect breathing level was elevated. So notice the mother's blood group is blood group zero and side is A. Resource positive. Both of them are resource positive. So this is not a case of resource incompatibility. This is when they tell you that they have the mother and the child have different blood group. Yes, we have signs of hemolysis. The correct answer there is hemolytic disease of the neonate but ABO incompatibility, you can see that ABO incompatibility, ectatic type, you can see jaundice. So this is ABO incompatibility. The same question uh, repeated, ABO incompatibility. All right, this is uh, a three month old infant suffering from acute segmental pneumonia. This is patients having dyspnea, paradoxical bleeding, um, breathing like a cardiac and, and total cyanosis, total cyanosis is important for this question because in Ukraine sometimes they give different values about this respiratory and pulse ratio. Normally it's supposed to be 4 to 1, ratio of pulse to respiration is supposed to be, when we have 4 of pulse, 1 of respiration. The heart donors are normal size. So here we have ratio 1 to 2. So normally first degree respiratory failure, we have about 3.5 to 2.5, 2.5 to 1.5 then less than that. But here is ratio 1 to 2. That seems like second. But no, they are telling that this patient is having total cyanosis. So this is a condition of respiratory failure of third degree. Total cyanosis, third degree. This child is having acute pneumonia. They are asking us to choose the best variant of therapy. So the, the question is what drug can we give that have synergistic effects. That's just what they are asking here. And the best uh, in this option, number one, when they're asking us about drugs, even if it's a question we are not used to in crockets, don't think of a drug that you don't know. Think they majorly they ask about simple drugs. So think of drugs that you know. So choose the best variant of therapy. Here is Ampios and Amikacin. The uh, penicillin and aminoglycoside, they have synergistic effects. And that is the best answer in this case, Ampios and Amikacin. A three-year-old child has been suffering from fever, cough, and coryza, cough, coryza, and conjunctivitis for four days. Uh, reading to accept maculopapular rash on face and so on. What is your diagnosis? You know that uh, measles have these three C's. When you sit in the question, it helps you to quickly pick your answer. So we we'll see question on rubella. We'll be able to compare them. We we'll see question on scarlet fever. We'll be able to compare. 
them. So when you see cough, coriza, and conjunctivitis, the three C's, sometimes they will tell you about the coriza with another word. But when you notice cough, conjunctivitis, and coriza, that is a case of uh, measles. Case of measles. In rubella, also there will be macropapular rash, but there will be enlargement of the hospital lymph nodes. Enlargement of hospital lymph nodes. So they call it the jammer measles. It's like the three day measles. The three day measles. Scarlet fever caused by group A strep. Patient will have fever, headache, and so on. And also have those rashes on the pastial lines, that is the skin folds. And they be great. they can you can have like patches on the uh, tonsils, you can have enlargement of some maxillary lymph node in condition of scarlet uh, fever. TO that has been ill for three days, you can see three days. No growth fever, severe cataract presentations, slight maculopapular and a botox and enlarged hospital. For me, this enlarged hospital lymph node is even more reliable than for me to take note of the three days. But however, three days, so hospital lymph node, hospital lymph node is a case of uh rubella. rubella. All right, a three-year-old boy fell ill abruptly, and uh, fever up to 39 degrees, and you can see patients basically have a meningococcemia at the infectious, infective toxic shock stage of first degree. So what medication should be administered? So when a patient is having bacteremia, patient is having the shock, a result of infectious agent being present in the blood, you want to give an agent that is bacteriostatic in action, but not by bactericidal. If it is bactericidal, it will cause degradation and everything in the in the bacteria, and they release their toxins, like worsening the condition of the patient. So we need a bacteriostatic agent, together with uh, is together with steroid in this particular. So the bacteriostatic agent combined with steroid in this case is chlorophenicol. It's, it's bacteriostatic in action. So chlorophenicol plus prednisone. So long. let's take note of that even in real life. A seven year old girl has mild form of varicella. So, when they are telling about varicella, about chicken pus, and they are telling us about uh, cerebral manifestations or neurological manifestations, the answer is always encephalitis. Encephalitis. Not meningospholitis, encephalitis. Again, seven year old male fell abruptly ill, fever, headache, sore throat, vomiting, and in three hours. It is more intensive in axilla and groin. You can see. The, the the rash in the artillery and groin. We're talking about the pastel lines. Mucus may be of oropharynx is hyperemic. Does it sound familiar like what we said earlier? Grayish patches is on the tonsils. So maxillary lymph nodes are enlarged and painful. So this is a condition of uh, scarlet fever. And they give you all those history ahead and then tell you about oropharynx hyperemic. Rash on artillery and groin. These are pastel lines. So this is a condition of uh, scarlet fever. Even though they are not telling me about strawberry tongue or so. Eight year old boy fell ill acutely. He's present with fever, weakness, headache, abnormal pain, recurrent vomiting, then diarrhea, and tenesmus. Tenesmus is want but can't. He wants to go to the toilet but he can't. Stools occur 12 times daily and scanty, contain a lot of mucus. You see, everything might present like salmonellosis, but immediately when they are telling you about strokes of blood, and they're telling that the sigmoid god is tender. For me, when I just see sigmoid god is tender, I know they are asking us to choose dysentery or shigellosis. The same. So, what is your diagnosis? So, the answer is yes, dysentery, shigellosis. So, you don't get that wrong. I administer treatment for a patient that is to have night and hungry abdominal pains. So, one thing is that you want to try to decrease the acidic secretion in this kind of. Uh, a patient and which agents can help us to do that? The patient also is uh, this proton pop inhibitor. Is sometimes you know they have to tell us about all this their training, but this is this one at least is a proton pop inhibitor, and we are not seeing any of that yet. So this is the correct answer. It's like triple therapy or so. A woman delivered a child. Here we discovered that for for. For newborn that is having hemolytic disease of the newborn due to results incompatibility or ABO incompatibility, the answer they've been choosing in pediatrics have been uh, exchange blood or replacement blood transfusion. So uh, also, you know, we know that we can use phototherapy. However, the, the answers have always been replacement blood 
or transcription. There are different categories, there are different classification for putting it under uh, phototherapy, but that's not really necessary for us to be discussing this case. A woman delivered a child, it was her fifth pregnancy, but the first delivery. Interesting. Mother's blood is A, resource negative, newborn resource positive. I can see the level of indirect unconjugated blue being 82 elevated. Shows therapeutic action, so it's replacement blood transfusion. We come across it many times. A mother with an infant visited pediatrician for expert advice, a baby was born with body weight of 3,200 grams, that's 3.2 kg, and body length 50. He's one year old now. How many teeth should the baby have? So there's a formula for calculating number of teeth. It is n minus 4, n minus 4, where n is the age of the child in months. So at one year, that's 12 months. So 12 minus 4, that's 8. So how many teeth should the baby have? 8. So that's how to pay about that. Here also we have 3 kg. Baby is one year old now. What is required normal mass? Uh, after one year, after one year, so you know that at one year the weight of the baby should be about 10 kg. So, but they're giving us weight at birth. Usually, there's there's a table up to one month. But let me just give us the clue. For the first one month, it is 600 grams in addition to the original birth weight. For the second month, it is 800 grams. For the third month, it's 800 grams again. Now, from that, from the Third month from at the end of that third month up to the twelfth month, just be subtracting fifty to know what will be the weight gain at the end of each month. So, for example, this is weight at birth three thousand grams. So, at the end of first month, it will be three thousand plus uh, six hundred. That be three thousand six hundred. At the end of second month, it will be three thousand six hundred plus eight hundred. So that will give us uh, four thousand four hundred. Then you add again the third month. There's another. 800 uh, weight gain so that'd be uh, 4400 plus 800 again that give us uh, 5200 so from that next 800 the fourth month the child is going to gain 750 grams so be subtracting 50 800 minus 50 so at the end of fourth month it will be 750 subtract 50 again it will be 700 from to be 700 subtract 50 again 650 so as we continue to subtract 50 at the end of each month eventually you get to i think about 350 at the 12th month and when you add that together it will give us around 10 not exactly 10.5 or so when i did the calculation but the if your approximate is about 10.5 uh, kg so there's no need to cram it first month weight gain is 600 second is 800 third is 800 40 750 50 700 60, 650, 600, and so on and so forth. Just be subtracting 50 as from the fourth month. Six month infant was born with body mass 3 kg and length 50 cm. He is given natural feeding. How many times per day instant, uh, infant should be fed natural feeding? So they said it's five. All right. So immediately after this, uh, 20, this, these are like 25th question, question 75, so we stop here and then make another uh, video section. In fact, it's 6.5 months now and it's given natural feeding. How many times per day supplements should be given? So supplements, natural feeding should be 5 times, supplements should be given uh, 2 times, 2 times.